Hey everyone, this is Ron Vadim with the Plan to Functional Programming. Welcome to another episode of the Common List Study Group. Today we're going to begin our series on concurrency in Common Lisp. Um, I have um, Elijah Malaby here who is uh, going to be covering one second. I think I think someone has feedback. Someone could someone mute themselves because the stream is actually getting. <laughs> That's weird. There shouldn't be any feedback. No, there wasn't feedback. More than um, I was hearing um, uh, the. Uh, I'm getting. I'm getting. How about that? Uh, that no, better? no. I think someone has YouTube uh, live stream running in the background. Did that fix it? Uh, hold on. Got it. I got it. That's fine. Um, I will... Uh, so, I fixed it. It was just a technical problem on my desktop. For some reason, it didn't mute my stuff. Fish. Um, okay. Anyway, um, today we'll be covering um, concurrency and common lisp. Um, Elijah Malaby will be beginning... Um, our, di our journey from, um, well, I'll just let him take over. He's going to be presenting this series. For folks who are on our YouTube uh, live stream right now, um, please uh, post your questions on there. Um, we will look at um, all the questions and answer them as, um, uh, you know, one as we go through stuff. So, Elijah, take it away. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Elijah Malaby. I go by Jace online on the, you know, Discord and stuff one of the moderators of the list Discord, and I'm sort of around the community. I'm going to be walking us through some concurrency and threading um, libraries today, uh, starting with uh, Bordeaux Threads, and then possibly, you know, going on to Shinmero's wonderful Atomics library, and then, you know, once again, time permitting, getting onto to Parallel, and then, you know, we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, but Bordeaux Threads is sort of where, you know, you start and where you kind of have to you know, build everything off of if you want to talk about threading in the common list ecosystem. So uh, what, what is Bordeaux Threads? Bordeaux Threads is a portability library. Actually, um, since we now have this, why do I have so many tabs? One second. Uh, there we are. That's the tab. Yeah. So uh, Shimera actually very recently created this great little website here, uh, shimera.gamers.io slash portability which lists, you know, the status of different portability libraries across different implementations. Uh, Bordeaux Threads here is supported on, you know, everything but JSCL, which is JavaScript, so it's not even multi-threaded, uh, local or mezzano or sickle. But everywhere else, it, it has, um, it claims to have 100% uh, support, which is awesome. Um, what that means is that uh, either the Bordeaux Threads developers or the developers for those particular implementations or occasionally some third party has come in and implemented Bordeaux Threads API in terms of some particular implementation specific extension because, well, threading isn't covered in the common list standard, but it is extremely important and useful to have. Uh, so let's sort of get started with Bordeaux Threads basic API here. Let me... Uh, Increase my font size. That good for everybody? Um, um, just a little bit more. I don't know if I can make it any bigger than that very easily. Um, hold on. I'm trying to look at the stream just to make sure. Ah. Yes, I think it's fine in the in the stream. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Awesome. Okay. There's a slight yeah. delay between the the, the, the stream and uh, when we're presenting, so. My yeah, that there, there always is. Anyway, so uh, what I've got here is uh, Bordeaux Threads uh, Def Package, right? So we're you know it just lets us look at all the different things that it exports, and actually provides some nice you know uh, surface level documentation for the package as well, right here. Um, you know, so it it, it provides uh, some sort of sort of standard things you'd expect. You know, making threads, talking about the currently active threads, talking about um, locks, recursive locks, condition variables, semaphores, timeouts, and then a couple things that are more specific to list right here, these default special bindings and, you know, whether or not you even have thread support, 
uh, stuff like that. So um, let's sort of get started with some example code here, I suppose. Uh, the basic operation that you're going to have anytime you're doing threading is, is making threads. You're going to be making threads all the time, managing those threads, that kind of stuff. So let's go ahead and oh, I'll make a little variable here. Yeah, parameter. Start that at zero, and then I'm going to make a thread that and make thread takes a takes a function, right? And it runs that function on some other thread. So I'm going to just make a little lambda here that increments my z variable. Um, and then there are a variety of extra options that I can pass, but I'm not going to worry about any of them right now. You'll notice that actually that thread took so short amount of time to run that before I even got around to printing out the object representing it, the thread was actually already finished. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and sure enough, I can, I can take a look at my Z now, and it's been incremented. Uh, let's say I were, however, to say sleep for 10 seconds. And now you'll see that that thread is running instead of finished. And I can actually take a look at that. And, you know, it says a live P here, which is whether or not it's still there, and a variety of other information that you can look about the thread if you care about that. This is actually an SBCL specific thread object. That's because Bordeaux threads, the way it wraps this is it actually tries and makes it as lightweight a wrapper as possible. And so oftentimes you'll see that the thread objects are implementation specific objects that just, you know, the, these different functions have been implemented for those objects directly. Anyway, so now if I look at that again, you'll notice, you know, just printing up that object again, it's finished. Um, and it's actually captured the return value there for me. Uh, and sure enough, Z has been incremented again. Uh, so this is sort of the basic operation here is I take, I, I take a little function. I say, hey, spin off this, uh, you know, thread here and call this function on this new thread. And then I get uh, an object back which represents that thread that I can then do stuff with. Uh, so that's sort of the basic thing. And then, you know, you have sort of the basic functions on those. You have uh, so can I, uh, Sorry, can I ask a question here? Sure. Um, okay. If uh, if support threads P is nil, um, what does B, BT make thread do behind the scenes? Does it attempt to create a green thread? Or uh, does it have its own implementation? That would be very implementation specific. Okay. Right. I would guess that support thread P is defaulted to nil somewhere in the default implementation. Ah, I don't see it here. Okay. But, um, yeah, that would be very implementation specific. There are actually implementations where you need to do... Um, uh, you actually need to do like call start multiprocessing before you use any functions in the Bordeaux Threads API. SBCL is not one of those implementations, so I kind of cheated a little here. Um, but uh, okay, and then some implementations do actually use green thread just as their as their generic threading interface. Um, and in those cases, you know, make thread would make a green thread. Uh, there isn't a uh, green thread based implementation of Bordeaux threads that's totally portable. In principle, you could make one. In practice, that would be more than a little bit of a headache and more than I really would want to have in a library like Bordeaux threads, which is really just trying to provide a consistent, you know, portability layer. It's trying to be as lightweight as possible. So. Okay, cool. Thanks. So... We have, uh, you know, basic operation, BT make thread, and there are a variety of other ways we can get thread objects. You know, we can call BT current thread, and, you know, there's one. This is the thread for my REPL that I'm running right here. Uh, you know, Sly has actually named this thread. That's one of the arguments to BT make thread is actually you can, you can say, hey, give a name, and that can be, you know, whatever you want it to be there. Uh, thread P, you know, BT thread B. Fairly self explanatory. It's, you know, is it a thread or isn't it? Thread name, again, fairly self explanatory, the basic operations. Then you have sort of these operations down here, which are the other things that operate on threads. Um, you have, you know, uh, BT destroy thread. Uh, 
by which uh, yeah terminates the thread. It uh, knocks it off. Um, it's uh, you have to be careful calling that one. Interrupt thread is similar. Like uh, these two functions right here, interrupt thread and destroy thread. Uh, those ones are a little uh, sensitive. I guess it's probably the simplest way of putting it because they're exactly what happens when you call them is a bit implementation defined. Uh, you know that, you know, after destroy thread, you know the thread will be gone. Interrupt thread, uh, that one's actually useful basically only for debugging, and even then you want to be careful with it. What it lets you do, and let me do a little demo here, because I'm going to. I'm going to make a thread here, and it's going to sleep for 30 seconds. And I'm not going to bother naming it, because it doesn't need a name. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to bt interrupt thread, that thread, and I want it to call break. And oh look, I'm in the debugger now. But I'm not in the debugger on my REPL. I'm actually in the debugger on that anonymous thread that I made. Um, and, uh, and this isn't really a great place to be because there's not a whole lot I can do from here other than kill the thread. But, sorry, one sec. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, not a lot I can do from here, but in principle, if this thread were doing something much more complicated, I would have a full backtrace of whatever's going on on the thread. I could, you know, inspect the different arguments, and most importantly, right now, I can continue. And if I look at that thread object, it's still running. And, you know, uh, hash v13, still running, still running, still running. I mean, really, it's just still sleeping is what it is. Um, and that's going to keep going for the next, you know, 30 seconds or so. Um, so interrupt thread basically lets you basically tell a function, hey, stop whatever you're doing, call this function, and then get back to what you're doing when the function returns. Uh, and you really only ever want to use it for debugging purposes. If you're using that for actually managing threads in any non-trivial way, it's a really easy way to get yourself into all kinds of nasty edge cases. But it is useful for specifically that one use case of, of just dropping into the debugger on some other thread. And of course, you know, it's just right there to kill it. Uh, thread alive P, you know, this is what's giving us our, our little status here. Uh, if I BT thread alive P, let's see, is it done yet? Yeah, it's done. Finished. Um, then you have join thread which is an operation you probably have heard of in other threading APIs as well. Uh, it basically is uh, wait until that thread finishes. Basically put my thread to sleep until some other thread is done. That thread is already joined, so this will just return. And it actually, um, it returns the, whatever value the function on that thread returns, because it, it captures that. Um, so that's basically a way of saying I need to wait until some other thread finishes whatever it's doing, and I need to capture whatever it, it finished with. Uh, and then finally, I have thread yield. Oh, don't have that one. Uh, BT thread yield. You know, it's basically, it's um, uh, on implementations that are cooperatively multi-threaded, you need to uh, periodically call this just to make sure that those other the other threads get chances to run. Um, it's not something that you need to do on like SBCL or any implementation that uses native threads, uh, but it is important on implementations that are green threaded. Um, if you're only supporting implementations that are natively threaded, you don't have to worry about it, basically. Um, and all threads, which, you know, it's just, again, just introspection. All threads. There are all the threads, and they're just sort of sitting there doing their thing. Uh, so that's basically all there is to know about, like, creating and destroying and interrupting and managing the thread objects themselves. Uh, then we have default special bindings, which is a really important variable to get to know. Uh, BT, default special 
binding. You don't have anything on there right now. But basically, what default special bindings is for is um, when you so so thread binding, um, dynamic variable binding, our thread local, right? This is one of the things that's sort of important to to get to know about about dynamic variables. If I you know I got my my z variable here, good old z. If I say let z be 25, right? And I there we are. And I bt make thread. Um, ah, Michael, you joined us finally. Hey, hey. 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 we got started without you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> uh, anyway, so you know, default special binding. So if I, uh, you know, so basically dynamic variable bindings are thread local. So I can, you know, bind my little z variable here to be 25. And if I bt make thread sub lambda, actually I need to do something a little sneakier. Just I'll explain why I'm doing this in a moment. Uh, uh, I output just because I want to catch that. And if I print z to out. Um, so here I'm, I'm dynamically binding my z variable to 25, and I'm actually capturing the current uh, standard output. Um, and then I'm headed over to another thread. I'm printing out z2 standard output. Actually, not necessarily a good idea because streams on SBCL aren't actually thread safe. But I don't think anything's going to go wrong, so let's see what happens. Four. So z was 25 in this scope. And yet that doesn't actually occur on the other thread where this lambda is getting called, right? The global value of z takes precedence. And that's because the value of z inside this dynamic scope wasn't captured when we moved over to the other thread. There are a couple ways to solve this. One of them is you can pass an extra argument to bt make thread. So, I always forget whether or not initial bindings is in a list or just a list of symbols. Because I, I don't use it nearly enough. <laughs> uh, let me just I believe it's an a list. Yeah, I think it's an a list as well. But I, I always want to check. Yeah, very. Yeah. So I'm guessing yeah, it's an a list. So, so what I can do here is I can say, hey. Um, Initial binding is going to be D has value 30. Ah, yes. Ha. And this is the problem, right? Because um, that should have printed 30, but uh, threads aren't, um, the streams aren't thread safe, basically. And so when you capture a stream like that, you never really know what you're getting. Um, but, it, but at the very least, you can see that it, uh, it definitely printed out something different. Um, so um, can I uh, mention, could, you could fix that by just adding a, spe uh, a special binding uh, in initial bindings to the standard output stream, couldn't you? I actually am effectively already doing that. Oh, That's why I okay. capture standard output as a local variable, and then that gets closed over on the lambda. Okay. But I was just wondering right. if, you, if you copy it into... Um, yeah, it's got a reference to the stream. The problem is that the stream is getting read from enclosed by fly before the thread finishes doing its job. Okay. Okay, got it. Uh, I could solve that. I might be able to solve that by doing a bt join thread. Uh, there, there, there. Like so. Okay. Might be able to do it that way. There we yeah. are. 
that basically, you know, that prevents the block from exiting until the thread has claimed that it's finished its job. Okay, but that makes sense. But at this point, I'm no longer really being concurrent. I'm, you know, and right. I, I could spin off multiple threads and then wait on one of them one after another, right? And then both, all of those threads would be in parallel, but my system would just wait until all of them had finished. But right now, since I only am spawning off one of the threads, calling join in it right of way just kind of defeats the purpose. Right. Um, Makes sense. But, uh, but that does sort of solve that, that concurrency issue there, right? Is that, you know, we, the standard output there is being read from enclosed way too quickly if I don't make this thing wait until that thread is done. Right. So, that's that. Uh, so, basically, what's going on here is by setting initial bindings, I can basically control what, um, uh, what the what the dynamic bindings are going to be on this new thread, uh, taking precedence over the global values, right? So if I want this thread to you know not be able to, um, and of course if I'm if I'm making the lambda right here, I could just put a let right inside that lambda that makes those bindings. But let's say I have some already existing function that I just want to call and I want to control what its bindings are, where it's, you know when it looks around at the global environment, I can set that right here. Um, default special bindings is similar. It's basically, uh, it's the default variable, the default value of the initial bindings argument. So if you don't pass anything to initial bindings, it grabs the default special bindings. And so that's useful if you want to sort of, across the board, make it so that threads uh, see a particular value of that particular binding that isn't the global one. And of course you can, you can, you know, dynamically bind to default special bindings. I can um, bt default special bindings. Uh, I always forget the way that you cons onto an a. Well, it's an a list, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cons v thirty onto bt default special bindings, and then I can, you know, do exactly what I was doing before, you know, actually, hey, Z is actually 25 in this scope, but, uh, and, you know, out is standard output, um, and then, now I don't need to bother specifying anything right in here. Right, so I can I can dynamically bind to default special bindings, and that way I can affect all of the make thread calls in a particular dynamic scope. So um, that, is that is that let binding malformed? Uh, yes, it is. I think you want list star, don't you? No, I just want a con. Oh yeah, another con. There you go. There we are. Thanks. Right, so same right, idea there. Uh, we have an echo now. I go. You need to uh, mute down your, you got to get feedback or put, a, put some head, headsets on. Thanks. Yeah, so this makes sense to everybody so far? In just a second. I'm just, uh, yeah, this makes sense. At least for me. So, this is all really stuff that you can explore with a single thread. And just because I dislike doing multi threaded stuff by spawning off a whole bunch of threads in the background, because that just gets irritating after a little while, and I only really need two threads for the next couple things that I'm going to be demonstrating, I'm going to cheat a little. Why? <laughs> oh, uh, uh. M REPL new. Second thread. There. Wait. Okay. So, what I've just done is I've made a second REPL attached to the same process. Oh, that's badass. I didn't know that you could do that. 
Oh, yeah, it's really convenient. <laughs> it's not something you can do in Slime without loading an extra contrib, and the Slime multi ripple contrib is, uh, it lags behind, slides pretty hard. Um, but, uh, but Sly supports everything on all of its multi repls uh, In fact, it actually uses the multi repl contrib for its default REPL, and then it made sure that that supported all of the things that Sly's original REPL contrib supported. Right, and so all of Sly's multi repls are fully featured, and you can just spawn as many of them as you need, and they all run on separate threads, which is important. So now if I BT, BT all threads, I now have two M REPL threads. One of them is this one. The other one is this one. Ta-da. So uh, now I can really start demonstrating some of the different, uh, you know, synchronization operations that we have baked into um, for the threads. Locks, mutexes. So I like to call them bottlenecks. <laughs> uh, simplest way of keeping two bits, of, two threads from screwing with a given part of your program at once. Stick a bottleneck on it. Now only one thread can touch that thing at a time. Um, really easy to use uh, conceptually, in principle. In practice, really hard to actually make right and performance, but they're an important primitive to have, so got to learn them. Let's help if I could type. I wanted to name this lock foo, just for fun. And now if I still free over here, now I can start doing fun stuff. Like I can acquire the lock on this thread and then try to acquire it on this thread too. And that'll just hit. It'll sit there and wait until I release the lock over here. Sit up, right? Um, and generally speaking, you wouldn't want to be using acquire and release lock directly. Border threads provides much nicer with lock held macro, where I can give it the lock and say, let's, uh, let's sleep for 30 seconds. And now, oh, whoops. What? What do you mean recursive lock attempt? That's a <laughs> weird error. That's wrong. <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, no. Actually, that's correct. Actually, that's perfectly correct. Because you know what I've forgotten? I forgot to release the lock on this thread. Oh. And this is why you never use acquired release lock directly. It's super easy to forget which thread has the lock. So now that counter is counting down for 30 seconds. And so now, after 30 seconds or so, that counter is going to finish what it's doing. And once it finishes, my second REPL here is going to take the lock again, and I'll have to remember to release it. Um, so that's sort of the basic primitive you've got going on there. You have then recursive locks, and the difference between a regular lock and a recursive lock is really just that a single thread can take a recursive lock more than once, right? So, uh, and that's useful if you have um, a whole bunch of operations uh, that are going to be done on a particular lock, right? A whole bunch of, like, unsafe operations, uh, like for a particular data structure, let's say. Let's say you have some, some like, queue that you're synchronizing using a lock so that only one thread can operate on that queue at once, right? And now I have this thread that needs to do, like, five operations on the queue. And it would really suck if it had to take and release that lock around each one of those individual operations. And I don't want to have to provide a different version of my API, one that locks and one that doesn't, because then people might screw up which one, you know, they call in which spot, right? Recursive lock can solve that. By making the lock on the queue recursive, now around a group of operations, you can just take the lock. And now in each of those individual operations, they'll take and release the lock again. But that's a cheap operation comparatively. Taking the lock a second time and then releasing it while you have the lock already held is super cheap. Um, it does require a little more state in the lock, because it has to keep counter for how many times it's been taken. 
But other than that, repairs of watch are actually quite convenient to have. Um, so, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot more to them, though. I mean, it's really just the same basic API. Um, make lock, lock P, etc. Then we have condition variables and semaphores, which are sort of the, the real, the really useful concurrency primitives, in my opinion, are uh, much, much nicer and easier to deal with than locks directly. You still have to use a lock with a condition variable, but not with a semaphore. Semaphores are nice and high level. So what is a semaphore? So, so semaphores, um, whole lot of stuff in there. Don't worry about it too much. I, I may get into that eventually. A semaphore, the important thing, is the count. What a semaphore is, is basically a thread-safe counter, but it's a, bit more, it's a bit more than just a thread-safe counter because what will happen is, so there are two operations on a semaphore. There's signal and wait. And the idea is that if I BT wait on a semaphore, say I'm one, that's going to block. Now if I look at my semaphore up here, See, it's a wait count is now one, because so there's one thread waiting on it. And then I can BT signal semaphore. And now down here, this concludes, right? But I can signal it more than once. I can signal it, you know, three times there. And now I can wait on it three times. So this lets me create some kind of resource counting. I can set up the semaphore to have some count of resources in it. And now when a thread needs one of those resources, it waits on the semaphore. And if the semaphore counter is non-negative, if it's positive, rather, it decrements the counter. And it knows what the count is because that gets returned. And then um, if the counter is already at zero, my thread will just get put to sleep until some other thread signals the semaphore. And you can actually pass explicit counts to these as well if you want to um, count five. And now I've just added five, you know, whatevers, whatever resources you're tracking to this semaphore. And similarly, I believe there's a count on the wait side. No, there isn't. There's no count on the wait side. Right. So the, the wait side, the way semaphores work is every time you do wait on, it will decrement the counter internally, right? So... It will decrement it if the counter is positive. Right. Oh, okay. Yes, that's right. And that's important. That's correct. It'll put your thread to sleep if the counter is, neg is, uh, is zero. Right, that's right, that's right. And then, um, and it'll put your thread to sleep until the counter gets above zero, in which case your thread will get woken up, it'll try and take the counter. If there are like 10 threads waiting on that counter, it's possible that, you know, you're not the one who's going to get it this time. Um, it's actually synchronized so that you aren't going to get like 10 threads all being woken up at once just because one count went up. Right. But, um, that's right. Now, I'm just yeah, saying that so, that's the reason why uh, wait on semaphore wouldn't have uh, an additional count because um, yeah, that's it, not it what its intention it, is. Strictly yeah. speaking. Right. Yeah. If you need multiple resources, you just call wait multiple times. Right. Exactly. Anyway. So, and then you have condition variables. And condition variables are interesting because they need to still be synchronized by an extra lock. Right. And so the idea with a condition variable is where a semaphore keeps track of some counter internally. A condition variable is just something that you can wait on. And it's just the waiting and the notify bit of the semaphore. So when you wait on a condition variable, your thread gets put to sleep until some other thread comes along and calls notify on the condition variable, and that'll wake your thread up. Uh, you need to have it all synchronized by an extra lock because the condition variable itself isn't actually... Well, I mean, it, in a weird way, the condition variable isn't thread safe. <laughs> uh, only one thread can operate on the condition variable at a time is really the point. Uh, but when you wait on the condition variable, you actually tell it what lock you're synchronizing against. And I, I'll demonstrate this in a moment. And it'll actually free that lock. It'll release that lock as long as your thread is waiting. And then when your thread gets woken up again, it'll take the lock again before your thread continues executing. Uh, and that way, 
you know, as long as your thread is actually executing, you have the lock. But while you're waiting, you don't actually hold the lock, and so other threads can operate on the resources held by this, you know, tracked by this condition variable. So, uh, C bar BT make condition variable. Now I'm not going to name that one. So, you have this C bar, SBCL calls it a wait queue, and if you've been keeping a close eye, you'll note that a, um, that a semaphore is actually made out of a mutex and a wait queue. So, right. uh, that's the way it stays actually thread safe even when you aren't synchronizing with an extra lock. Um, so now that I have my lock and my C bar, oh, I forgot to release the lock from the thread over you. <laughs> Once this again. Don't, this is why you don't take and release locks directly, guys. <laughs> Easy to screw up. Always use with lock held. It's so much easier, I promise you. There are only like a handful of algorithms where you may ever want to be manually acquiring and releasing locks. But even then, it's always a headache. You never want to do that. I'm only doing it for demonstration here because I want to be able to run arbitrary code between the acquire and the release. And so I want to have my REPL prompt here. And uh, in order to do that, I can't be using with lock held because I can't like just run a nested REPL. In principle, I could actually run a nested REPL, but I, I, that, that involves pulling an extra library to do extra nonsense, and I don't want to bother with that right now. Um, so uh, what you do here is you uh, BT uh, acquire lock lock. This old dance again. And then I can do BT condition wait, right? And I give it my, my condition variable and a lock that I hold. And now the thread is waiting. And now you'll note, if I look at the lock, it's free, even though I acquired it up here. So now I can down here, I can again acquire the lock. I can BT acquire lock, lock. And now I can condition notify this condition variable, which is being synchronized by this lock. And this thread has not exited yet. And, and that's, that's because I still have the lock. Right. But as soon as I release the lock, This thread releases here, and now you'll note that the lock is held once again by thread 1, not by thread 2. This thread took the lock again. I can now BT release lock over here. And now the lock is free. That's the basic sort of life cycle, I guess you could say, of a condition variable. Is you take the lock, you wait on the condition variable and the lock. Some other thread takes the lock it notifies on the condition variable, and then it releases the lock, then your thread wakes up and takes the lock again, and you get to keep going. And then you can release the lock at your leisure. That's sort of the basic, uh, basic goings on. Uh, so. So when you release the lock, I have a question. When you release the lock, yeah. Does does the release lock automatically do a uh, a condition notify then on the no. condition variable? No. Oh, okay. So you have to still call condition variable uh, the, yes. the condition notify. I acquire the lock to and I to wake up that that variable. other thread. Is what and I saying. acquire the lock. Okay. And I release the lock. This thread is still waiting. Okay. Good. All so right. I would have notified again. I missed that. Okay. Yep. All right. It's only when I acquire the lock, notify on the condition variable, and then release the lock, that now the lock is held back up here again, and I get to release it back up here. So one question I had was, is do you release before you notify, or do you not or, or does no, it matter? you have to notify while you have the lock. Okay. Because the condition variable is not thread safe in and of itself. It needs to be synchronized by some other lock. Got it. Okay. Any and all operations on the condition variable need to be done while you're holding the lock that every other thread is synchronizing on that on right. that condition variable with. 
That's right. Okay, so it works like um, uh, just uh, every standard um, threading library then. Yeah, okay. yeah. Got it. It's, it's like all of this is relatively standard if you're familiar with threading libraries in other languages. Okay. Good. Uh, there is actually one other trick that you need to be aware of, which is that occasionally, for annoying threading reasons, uh, condition wait will return without you having the lock. That happens in extremely exceptional situations and when everything is kind of falling apart and burning anyway. So it's not really something you need to worry about on a regular basis. Um, but in principle, it's possible for an interrupt to be signaled on your thread while you're waiting on a condition variable that forces your thread to unwind. And in that event, it's possible that anything you've got in unwind to protect handlers will have to execute without locked help. Okay. Which is annoying, but there's not really anything you can do about it because threads are weird and annoying and hard to work with. Um, so it, it's possible for you to exit condition wait. And actually, it's even in principle possible for condition wait to return without the lock held. But it only happens in extremely exceptional situations. And, you know, while it, it, it can't hurt to be, uh, can't hurt to actually check for that, although performance, um, in, in practice, if, you, if you've returned from condition wait without the lock, something's gone very wrong. It can happen, and it's documented as a thing that can happen, because there are situations where it will happen, but something's gone wrong. Um, it's not normal behavior. So it's an extremely rare situation that we need to be aware of. If it is, we actually have a bigger problem than... Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, generally speaking, it, it happens because something's interrupted your thread when it wasn't expecting to be interrupted. Got it. And that's another reason why you don't ever call interrupt thread, except for debugging. <laughs> Got because it. if you interrupt another thread and you exit the wrong way, it can do things like make condition wait return without the lock held. That makes that makes sense. Yeah. All right. You need to be you need to be careful with all that. Do I have an echo now? Uh, uh, no. no, but you're really quiet. So that's pretty much all there is to uh, Bordeaux threads. Um, it's a it's a pretty fairly minimalistic, but you know, standard threading library. It's got a whole lot of the stuff that you like to have around when you're doing threading work. Um, um I have one more additional question, actually, regarding thread shoot. yield. So, with with thread yield, you mentioned that. Um, it's only really useful if we have a cooperative threading implementation, like a green thread implementation. But in the case right. of preemptive threads, um, if you wanted to do, like, say, mimic coroutines on um, native thread implementation, is that possible with thread yield, or is that implementation Not guaranteed. Specific? Okay. Okay. Um, there, there also wouldn't really... I mean, I'm fairly certain... The thread yield will actually background your thread temporarily, or at least it'll give the operating system a chance to background your thread on most implementations. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on it for something where you're not using an implementation that's specifically cooperatively scheduled. Okay. Uh, there is also, uh, there's one other little fly in the ointment with condition notify, and this is something that I actually find annoying, but there's not a whole lot the board of threads people can do about it. Uh, and that's the condition notify. Uh, it's not guaranteed exactly how many threads condition notify will wake up. Um, there are implementations where it's only possible to wake up one thread that's waiting on a condition variable, and there are other implementations where it's only possible to wake up all of the threads that are waiting on the condition variable. It's mm. one of those two. It'll either only wake up one or it'll wake up all of them. But <laughs> there's no way to actually make it portable and guarantee either behavior. Right. Okay. Uh, and so you have to write it with that in mind. Anytime you use a condition variable, you have to write it under the assumption that it may only wake up one, but it might wake up all of them. And that has annoying performance considerations. 
like I have a library that I'm actually currently writing for doing concurrency stuff, and I, I had to kind of go out of my way to munge exactly where and how I call condition notifying condition wait to make sure that it doesn't like cause um, the, I believe the term is the thundering herd, right? Uh, and that's where like you wake up 20 threads or, or possibly not even 20, but like you wake up a lot more threads than actually should be woken up in that given moment uh, because you don't actually have enough resources for all of them. And so most of them are about to just go right back to sleep again, right? Because you really only intended to wake up one thread because you only had resources for one thread. But because your condition notified, notified all of them, they all woke up, one of them got the thingy, and the other, one all, other ones all had to go back to sleep. That's actually one uh, question I had because I noticed that condition notify doesn't um, actually um, specify whether you're waking up one or all. And in a yep. lot of other threading implementations, even like in C++, they... they notify they have, one, notify all. Yeah, yep, exactly. They're separate functions. They're separate functions. So I was wondering if they're, if they're, they're, if that existed or not, and it sounds like it nope. notifies the only, the only solution. So, yep. Got it. And it's really just a portability thing. On SBCL, I'm fairly certain that notify is notify one. Okay. Um... Uh, Actually, I, I think SB red condition notifying condition broadcast. Yeah. yeah. So SBCL has the ability, um, but not yeah. every threading implementation gives you that. So it's Correct. really okay. So Bordeaux threads is kind of stuck. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. They can only give you the minimal, you know, stuff that's accessible everywhere. Right. Absolutely. Um, and actually, fun bit of trivia. Ordo Threads was designed from the Klimsys threading interface. You say anyway. Klimsys like McClim? Yep. Wow. Yep. All right. Klim, Klim needs threading for a variety of reasons, and so it provides, for a while, the Klim spec required that implementations provide a portability library for basic things like threading. Um, just as part of the Klim distribution. Got it. Cool. That's actually a yeah. nice little bit of trivia. <laughs> it's uh, it's not as... It, Board of Threads is more fully featured than that now, but, yeah. you know, that's where they started. Anyway, so that's Board of Threads, um, and I guess that's our first hour or so. So I guess we have plenty of time to, you know, run straight on into Atomic. Um, so, just curious, Rom, how familiar are you with Atomic operations? Uh, a bit. <laughs> in, 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 I've been looking at uh, the Atomic implementation in, uh, in uh, C++. I've been, I haven't looked at uh, Atomics in the library that you mentioned, so... <laughs> Uh, but you know, covering it from the from 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 step zero is always a good idea. <laughs> sure, sure. So here's the uh, package behind Shinmara's Atomic Library. Uh, it's um, much smaller than Bordeaux Threads, but it doesn't actually need to expose a whole lot of stuff. Most important operation, I would say, is cast, and we'll get to what that does very soon. Uh, so, atomic operations. The basic idea behind them the basic idea behind an atomic operation is that it either, like, uh, as far as other threads are concerned, they can never observe it midway through completion. That's sort of the definition of being an atomic operation, is that no other thread can observe it partway through completion. Right? Uh, atomic compare and swap. It's sort of the, it's like a, um, it's sort of a classic example of a nice primitive atomic operation that you can have. And what it is, is you have some bit of global memory, like a special variable. Oh, right. Uh, I switched packages. So 
start back at zero. So, um, and since I have a little file open now, I might as well actually start doing that. So we have our little Z here, and it's zero, right? And what an atomic operation will do is you give it a, a place, and there's a, there's a particular list of places that are supported for this. Not all places have support for atomic. Uh, on SBCL, actually that's what this table that I pulled up right down here is for. On SBCL, uh, symbol value has support. So I can, I can do an atomic operation on a global, like so. So basically I can say, start and uh, go from zero to one. And the T there is saying it's succeeded, which means that if I go and look here, it's now one. And if I do that again, it's going to fail because I did that, right? And so the idea here is I give the current value is this second argument here, and this is the value that I want it to be, right? And the atomic operation will either succeed or it'll fail. And it'll fail if what I've claimed is the current value is no longer actually the current value, right? And so the idea is that it's going to go to this memory location Z right here, it's going to say, hey, is Z still 1? And Z, you know, it's going to find that, yes, Z is still 1, or at least now it's going to find that Z is 2. So that wouldn't actually be the case anymore. But uh, at the moment when it did this, Z was 1, so it said, well, Z is still 1? Yes, okay, replace it with 2. And that's an atomic operation. No other thread can observe that operation partway through completion, and no other thread can affect what's going on while that's partway through completion. It'll either succeed in doing the comparison and the swapping out of the old value for the new one, or it will fail because the old value that I've claimed is there isn't actually the current value that's in that memory location. Yeah, it'll either succeed or it'll fail. Is that because there's special instructions that special instructions? Yeah, so, um, um, could Michael, you, you're, could you, you're could still you. really quiet, but I'll repeat that question there. It was, uh, is that, that because there's special processor support? And, and basically, yeah, um, it's basically uh, processors these days have intrinsic operations for doing hardware-assisted compare and swap in a way that's completely atomic. So basically no other CPU core can observe you partway through a compare and swap operation. Right, and um, um, in x86 especially um, underneath, um, I'm assuming that a lot of the thread, uh, the Lisp implementations that implement um, compare and swap, um, are actually calling out to that specific function yeah. um, for yeah. that architecture. Um, I can actually demonstrate that for you. Um, it's, it's pretty neat because uh, it's very useful when you're doing like fairly high performance computing. You want to make sure certain uh, uh, pieces of data have their own cache line. So um, you could use a compare and swap operation, an atomic operation to ensure that um, the the uh they land at certain boundaries so then it makes it easier to like partition pieces of memory to thread out although i was kind of i was going to ask that that was my question i was like is this a basically using like the intrinsics underneath i mean i assumed that that's the case um but you know has with you know what we were talking about earlier about green threads and stuff I'm assuming that if someone uses this on a Lisp implementation that doesn't support um, so, or doesn't call out to the intrinsics, it's going to complain or spit out a error. Is that is that true? So uh, this library is actually much less portable than Bordeaux Thread. Okay. Uh, first thing to realize, um, what I've just sort of demonstrated here, and I don't know if you've been paying attention to my screen. Uh, is that uh, lock compare exchange, that's the x86 uh, sequence that actually performs the compare and swap operation. Um, I made a little thingy. But yeah, so it's just demonstrating that, yeah, it actually falls back on a hardware instruction for doing a compare and exchange, compare and swap. Anyway. So, Bordeaux, uh, so, so Atomic is actually much less portable than Bordeaux Threads. It's actually only supported on these five implementations, Allegro, TCL, ECL, Lisp Works, and SBCL. 
Uh, and it actually, uh, on those implementations, there's only a couple of places that are entirely portable. And that's actually simple vector ref and struct slots if you make them with particular parameter, with particular implementation specific options set. And if you were paying attention um, when I showed the package, you might have noticed that it exports its own depth struct. Yeah, I and saw that. And the reason that. for that is that uh, on implementations where struct slots uh, need extra options to be marked atomic, the atomic depth struct uh, will supply those extra options. That's really all it is. I'd actually list that right down here uh, on um, yeah, right, like for ECL, struct slots must be defined with the atomic accessors option. See depth struct for a portable wrapper. Uh, so that way you don't have to specify that option yourself. Or, yeah, I don't think you need to specify it. I think it just filled it in. I forget offhand, though. Because I, I use this on SBCL most of the time, and so, you know, I, uh, I don't generally worry about that because SBCL has... What's know, stopping SBCL from having uh, memref support? Who knows, honestly. Huh. It's possible they just haven't implemented it. And I have a question regarding that um, svref there. That's simple vector reference. Um, Correct. Isn't the, um, like isn't like a standard ax array access using a ref instead, or is this correct? Okay. Remember how I was? Yeah, remember how me and, and Wilfredo uh, and, and I think Michael, you even join in this as well occasionally. We hate on simple vectors. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's that's because simple vectors don't allow you to specify the type. There's no yeah. Exactly. Right. But that actually has a very specific advantage. And what that is is it means that simple vectors are always implemented as plain arrays of immediates, pointers or fixed numbers. Right. Right? And what that means is the accessor for a simple vector is always load a word. Right. That's right. Right? Which means that implementing a compare and swap operation on a simple vector is dead simple. Okay. <laughs> right? Right. Because it's always a word. You don't have to do any type dispatch. You don't have to do any, you know, inspection of the vector. You just have to do a bounce check, and then it's a word compare exchange. Right. That makes sense. So it's just so, because it's easier to implement... Um, okay. And but, so every implementation supported by this library provides SVREF support because it's, it's stupidly easy to implement. Uh, but that, that makes the argument that un until a ref is used, if you end up leveraging this library and there's like, <laughs> and there's certain cases where you do want uh, to leverage atomics, using SV, uh, simple vectors might uh, end up improving performance, right? Well, it would improve portability. It wouldn't improve performance. Right. Sorry. Yes, it would improve portability. Correct. Um. Yeah. Basically. So that's that's uh, that that that's that's a good good thing to note. Um, yeah. Because. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> if you want to write a library that uh, uses atomic operations. There are two things that you're allowed to do on every implementation, and that's atomics on a struct made using the atomic depth struct or on a simple vector. That's the only things that are supported on everything. And so if you want to write a utility library of atomic data structures, those are the only things you're allowed to use. It says slot value 2 as well down in that, in that table. That right? one is missing CCL. Oh, Okay. What is the um, what's the footnote there for the asterisk? Uh, That's under, basically just just about all of those are that you need to use the atomic depth struct. Oh, okay, yeah, that's not a big deal. Okay, yeah, uh, a few. Well, so it's not just that because um, on on SBCL, for example, the struct slot has to either be fixed them or T type. Um, and on at least one of them. Oh, I don't think it's for cat. If I remember correctly, for atomic, 
Uh, Atomic Inca. Uh, it has a completely different table, it has its own table entirely. Like, you can't actually do atomic ink F on a simple vector on SPCL. Um, because, you know, it's not always a number, it might be a big number, and that's complicated. But, uh, struct plots still have it. Uh, but the important thing there is that in a lot of them, uh, you get things like, it must be a fixed num, and it might be done with modular arithmetic. On SBCL, it, uh, if you want to do uh, a struct plot, it has to be an SBX word, right? And then again, modular arithmetic. And so you get this weird thing here if you want to use the atomic ink F operation. Instead of doing uh, a cast where you do the addition yourself, um, and actually, strictly speaking, exactly how portable that is is harder to say. Allow using using cast on numbers. Because Actually, Elijah, if you weird. go further down in, in those notes, it said something else specifically about SVREF. Um, yeah, AREF only works on extended words. So that means no, there... A simple array of words. Oh, a simple array of words. So that means there is some support, but it's not, you know, um, at least for this operation, for using standard... SBCL um, is the only one that does AREF. Okay. Yeah, that's not cool, but okay. <laughs> you do get car and cutter. <laughs> oh, all right. Right? Yeah. So we... you, you do get car and cutter on everything. For for atomic update, for, 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 for atomic ingest, you do actually get car and cutter on everything. But you don't get atomic cat. It, it, it's kind of a... Atomic operations are still becoming a thing that you can reasonably use uh, portably, right? And so this library gets you the bare minimum of what you might need, in short. Um, what it looks like to me is that in a lot of cases, uh, you, like if you really want to do atomic NGF and atomic DECF, you want to do it on a con cell, and you need to be using fixed numbers. And it'll probably wrap. So it, it's all, like, atomics, um, the, calling atomics a portability library in the same sense as Bordeaux thread is a little tricky because the behavior is even less, like, properly portable. I mean, Bordeaux thread suffers from this, too, in a few cases. Um, but, uh, but atomics, uh, you, you're, using, you're using atomics not so much because it guarantees you exactly portable behavior across implementations, but more because um, uh, in the future, uh, these implement operations may be much more broadly supported, and then you won't have to change anything, A. B, if you do have to switch to another implementation, this is an API that will at least be familiar to you, and you just have to learn what, what weirdness has changed, and that's all documented in this library. You don't have to go hunt down what the operations are deep inside that particular implementation. And I guarantee you, finding CCL atomic ink F decf is kind of a pain. Uh, same thing with CCL's atomic compare and swap. That's also a pain. And, like, SBCL also doesn't document these terribly well. It's better than some of the other ones. But my point is that um, uh, this, the portability library atomic, uh, at least for the moment, uh, there's a very, very tiny subset of it that you can really properly use portably, even on just the five implementations of support. But, in the, if you do need to switch implementations, at least this is an API that you already know, that you're already using, and it's documented exactly how it differs on these different implementations, and you can just go to its documentation instead of having to hunt down where it is in that new implementation doc for how this thing is different over here. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a perfect solution, but it's better than not having atomic operations at all, and it's getting better over time. All these implementations are still under pretty active development, and hopefully eventually all these operations will be a lot more portable in general. Okay, thank you. So, there isn't really a whole lot to atomics apart from, you know, Read the tables. 
This is just the documentation for the function, but, you know, read the tables. Uh, there are a lot of little gotchas. Um, and, you know, you have these very nice primitive operations. That, you know, you've got atomic, uh, you've got cat, you've got atomic incap, you've got atomic decap. Um, and, you know, you got to, you can use them to implement a whole lot of stuff. Like atomic cast, like is is a, a really nice primitive for doing thread synchronization that doesn't involve nearly as many calls out to the operating system. And sys calls are expensive, so uh, it can be really useful to to use these instead of like uh, just blindly reaching for a semaphore, for example. If you can, if you can protect what you need with something that's a little simpler and maybe falls back on a semaphore, so you're not like busy waiting, um, then that might actually improve the performance of your application, possibly even significantly. So yeah. Interesting. Have we had any comments from YouTube? I'm just curious. Uh, just a couple of uh. Thanks and uh, fair enough. And, hey, fair uh, enough. <laughs> but this this is this is really interesting. Um, I have um I have a couple of questions. So when you're implementing um say you know, and this is just again going back to my understanding of atomics come from um, me reading up on um, the new uh, atomic uh, implementation that uh, C plus plus has provided. Sure. And um so. There's a thing called in um, in C++ called like a memory fence for atomic operations. It's commonly used for things like yeah. Um, is do do you know if atomics um, does not provide memory fences? Okay. Which right. is a bit annoying because memory fences are kind of important. Okay. Um. So you you need to make sure that you're if you if you really worry about memory ordering and that kind of synchronization involving memory ordering, yeah, uh, you you do need to involve like a proper lock or a semaphore these days, um, just because that's almost guaranteed to actually be like taking or releasing a lock is almost like I mean it's a, it's probably a system call and that's definitely a memory fence, effectively. Uh, a system call will effectively be a memory fence. Okay, cool. Um, um, it's not a it's not a cheap memory fence. To be well, clear. <laughs> I I but never said it was. Get the job done. <laughs> I never said it was. I'm just saying hopefully, at least there's a way to do it. Hopefully, eventually we get memory barriers um, portable. Hopefully soon. It's a thing. It's in progress. You know. Well, you know, the, a lot of these new things in um, the in the in the library, and since we're you know talking about it, and Shinmara is you know implementing this, I'm, I'm I really thank him for doing it. That I'm curious about is is right now you know Common Lisp, at least my understanding uh, from our discussions and what we've been doing in the in these in these uh, talks is uh, it doesn't it, it depends on the implementation on whether or not there's a a memory model available that's you know conducive to implementing multi-threaded models on top of it. Um, yeah. In fact, for those of you who are you know not familiar with the C++ language, it wasn't until C++ 11 that C++ had got its own multi-threaded memory model. The runtime actually had to be modified in order for it to happen. So I'm just curious. Um, would some of these end up requiring you know some adjustments to? I guess it does. Uh, some adjustments to the implementation, the Lisp implementation, to yes. make some of these features available. So yes, okay. So the SBCL, for what it's worth, does provide memory barriers. What was that M fence you 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 saw earlier when you were looking for fence? Oh, that was um, that's an x86 specific thingy. It's probably what memory barrier is implemented in. Terms oh, okay. Of. Yeah. It it basically allows you to order memory. Um, there's ways of uh, in in access. Uh, there's uh, um, it prevents reordering memory right. accesses or writes across the fence because um, your compiler can be really clever, annoyingly clever, frustratingly clever. Um, <laughs> you seem to have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of hatred there going. <laughs> I hear. 
I hear I, 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 I am annoyed at how loose the C specification plays with memory accesses across threads. But that's a discussion for another day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, so like uh, different kinds of fences basically prevent uh, reordering the uh, visibility of memory operations from the perspective of other threads, right? So if I do a couple of operations, a couple of like uh, stores, and then I do a fence, and then I do a couple stores after that, I know that no other thread will be able to see the results of the stores after the fence before they can see the results of the stores before the fence. At least if it's a right okay. scenario. I haven't really heard of fences before other than, um, you know, Baggers does a lot of them with his GPU stuff. Yeah, yeah, he does talk about that occasionally. Okay. Barriers and fences are basically the same thing. Yes. Um, just two names for the same basic operation. But, I mean, it's basically, it really is like, you know, I uh, if I do some memory accesses, right, and I want to make sure that they're happening in a particular order. I I can I can put a fence between each of those memory accesses because I know they're happening in that particular order now. Uh, and really, it's it, it's often more about what other threads can see about what you're doing, or what you can see from other threads. You know, if you if you look at a particular variable, and then you observe that it's changed in a particular way, you might go and read the value of some other variable, and you expect that that variable has been updated since this variable has been updated. But then the CPU reorders those memory accesses so that the later access comes first, and now you have no clue about that dependency anymore. Right. So, memory barrier. Because so your CPU and your compiler are trying to execute all this stuff as quickly as they freaking can. Well, they're ignorant of it. You have to uh, give right. the, 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 the check to them to say, hey, don't, don't continue. There's other stuff happening. Well, I mean, it's, it's really just the, the uh, consistency model, right? Right. Uh, the consistency of the memory model is only defined in terms of one thread. Right. Exactly. But that's also why I was asking about that. Like, it sounds yeah. like it's almost as if the standard, since the standard doesn't provide well, the standard any doesn't sort of, talk about threads at all. Right. Since the standard doesn't talk about threads at all, it really was up to individual... Lisp implementations yep. to find out what is best for their use cases, I guess. And yep. uh, in order to create a real portability, portable library, it's really, really difficult to just merely oh, because yeah. of um, those drastic differences in some cases between the different Lisp implementations and how they handle threading in general. So, um, More or less. Interesting. Well, this, uh, I mean, the, the, the Atomics is, uh, it, 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 I'd like to see it, you know, I, I, I like I, I like the direction it's going. I like to see some of this oh, stuff yeah. getting in there um, because I think it would be really, really useful, especially when we start wanting to write atomic data structures or even data structures that are more, you know, uh, that could be leveraged in a concurrent way. Um, I mean, you could already way. use it to write atomic data structures. You just have to be a little careful about what things you use. What sort of best practices would you suggest, uh, given your experiences with this library, if a person wanted to say, write a data structures library on top of this? Um, I mean, uh, it depends on how much you care about portability, right? Like, for testing reasons, there's a library that I'm writing that, that uses Atomics, and for testing reasons, I've just been using classes, because SBCL does pass on, uh, does compare and swap on uh, regular spot values just fine. Um, but when I get to the point where I consider the API stable, I'm going to rewrite the entire thing in terms of structs and, uh, and simple vectors. Got it. Cool. Very you nice. Know, just for portability reasons. I'm excited because this, this library and, uh, and the review of Bordeaux thread, and even when we start getting into El Parallel, it opens up possibilities of, you know, implementing different kinds of High performance locking mechanisms on top of oh, yeah. uh, CL uh, that previously I didn't, I couldn't figure out a way to do it. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's it's really nice. I mean, if you're if you're only concerned with SBCL, 
SB thread has basically anything you could ever want to need, uh, want or need. Like, it's all in there. Um, and if it's not in there, like, I don't know if they have a reader's rider lock in SB thread. But, uh, but you could implement one really easily. I have an implementation of a reader's rider lock somewhere. Um, you know, uh, I wonder if I could find that real fast. Yeah, that'll probably take too long. <laughs> no, no, it's but anyway. Okay. So, but yeah. Okay, cool. Um, are there any other questions um, from the people who are on the the hangout? Um, well, YouTube I don't have a question, but um, considering you know we talked about Bordo threads and Atomics and you know all the portability between all the different implementations, I think it would be a good idea to bring up Shinmara's new project this week. I actually mentioned that earlier in the stream. Okay, I joined 15 minutes late, so fair yeah. enough. Great. Yeah. Yeah, this that is, documents everything, the status of all the portability. This cool. is yep. really excellent. I mean, one thing I'm curious about, and this might, and th this is not related to this, um, particular topic on concurrency, but certainly something we should uh, visit is uh, the CL environments library there. I didn't realize that um, that extension was uh, was available, that library. Well, well it started. Uh, it's not the only one like that. There's one that, uh, like, there's a CL environments is also trivial CLTL2, uh, and I want to say there's at least one other. Um, and they, they seem to have slightly different portability. It's a different implementation support, which is amusing. Irritating, but amusing. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, which means we have to write yeah. a portability library on the portability libraries, you know. <laughs> or issue PRs. <laughs> PRs are good. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Uh, oh. But yeah, and they have like float features and dissect, and like, all these are really nice. Um, um, don't use trivial garbage. Why not? Or at least don't use weak pointers and, you know, don't finalize. use finalizers. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, that's really what it is. Don't, 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 don't do that. Don't use finalizers. Please. Almost never a good idea to use the finalizer for something. Okay. And the, and the, the reason is that you never know what thread your finalizer will get called on. Right. Because any thread might, inter might initiate garbage collection, and finalizers can be called on any thread. Weak pointers and weak hash tables are actually really useful and convenient for very specific tasks. But finalizers, man, those things. I don't trust a finalizer any further than I can throw it. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. Um, um, yep. One more, one more question regarding this before we get we move to. Um, uh, I think we have time to actually cover out parallel two today. Hopefully, um, regarding uh, um, regarding uh, the the uh, I'm just looking at the Atomics library here in um, the API on my other on other machine here. Um, sure. There was one thing that you mentioned. So I guess one thing I was curious about because of um, the Allegro CCL and ECL and Lispwork stuff, like, are there particular things that are kind of like missing in some of the other lists that are preventing, like C Lisp, for example? I don't see it's on the list. Um, You'd need to ask Shinmara that question. Okay. All right. So I'd have to go and post that. Okay, I will post that later. All right. That's a different discussion. Yep. Got it. All right. I haven't I haven't actually looked at what's available on most implementations, honestly, because I focus pretty hard on SBCL in my day to day work. Cool. All right. Because I use well, SBCL as well as CCL occasionally since I run on Mac and yeah, you know, yeah. there are cases where one works versus the other. Like C L yeah. Objective C doesn't work on on SBCL, SBCL works perfectly well on on CCL, so I yep. <laughs> so those kind of things. Um, what that's why I'm, this this issue of portability is kind of important for me at least. Uh, and I sure. notice at least for this one, um, it supports SBCL and CCL for my use cases. So, all right, that's well, all I, I had. I mean, those are kind of the uh, the basic standard in the open source CL world these days. Right, runs on SBCL and CCL. 
Um, anyway, so I guess we have some time at least to get going with L Parallel if there aren't any other questions. Yeah. Very nice library. Yeah. Yeah. So L Parallel. Uh, L Parallel is a library for managing a thread pool, basically. Um, let's see. I'm going to have L Parallel's little documentation up so fast. Because it's got a lot of stuff going on in it. And I don't want to try keeping it all in my head while I'm trying to talk. So, uh, the basic sort of operations in L Parallel involve uh, making what's called a channel. So, let me just go ahead and make a quick channel here. Uh, uh, and actually, by the way, I have nicknamed L Parallel as LP in this package, just from my own sanity. So, the first channel you make, and I probably ought to have made a kernel before I even bothered doing that, but I, I, I like popping up with you other here. It's kind of nice. Um, so, the first channel that you make, uh, actually really any parallel operation that you try to do, needs a kernel. And the kernel basically is what wraps your thread pool, wraps this, this group of threads that it's going to manage for you and that you can submit jobs to and get results back from. Right, and so the first sort of parallel operation you do, it's going to pop up the debugger and say you need to make a kernel. You can always make the kernel by calling make kernel and then storing that in the L parallel star kernel star dynamic variable here. Uh, and you can even do that, you know, uh, you can even, you know, make kernel just for a particular task and dynamically bind it to that variable and use it in some dynamic field if you wanted to do that. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and make kernel. It's going to ask me for how many threads that I want. I'm going to go ahead and say four, and there we go. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, now that I have a channel, a uh, whole lot of stuff that I can do. <clears throat> So, just a quick question before you get to the channel. So, um, once you made the kernel the thre with four threads, does that channel automatically get assigned a thread to do work on, or do you have to no. submit something? It gets, the, it gets attached to the kernel itself. Okay. All right. So, it's really a communication mechanism to submit tasks through. Right? Correct. Okay. It really is like... So, you know, the basic, really, the really the primitive operations in, in L Parallel are making a channel and submitting a task on a channel. Uh, let's, let's make a random number. Cool. Uh, so, now, if I... Receive a result on this channel. Ah, it was 40. Cool. All right, so I, I found a random number between 0 and 50, and it was 40. Then I can do this repeatedly. I can submit as many tasks as I need on the channel, and then I can call receive result and get each of their return values in some order. The order is not guaranteed. Uh, if you need to keep track of which channel, which um, which tasks are associated with with which results, you need to create multiple channels to do that, because um, it doesn't provide that itself. Or you can have the task wrap its return value in something that indicates which task it was, you know, spawned from, and then you can read that off when you do a receive result. Uh, but the the receive result is not order anything at all. It's really whatever order they finished in, probably. Um, subject to concurrency nonsense. Uh, but that's sort of the basic operations that you have in L Parallel. Um, you're just, you know, making a 
making a channel, submitting a task, and receiving a result. You can actually supply extra arguments to submit tasks if you want to do that. You know, so I could have, uh, you know, I could have made this little, where did that come from? There. Could have made this parameterized over my n and then said n there and then passed in 50. Same basic idea. Uh, but that means that, you know, I could, I could, you know, uh, have, you know, I could have just done this. Same basic idea here. So, basically I can submit as many tasks as I want on this channel and then I can receive that many results off the channel, uh, and they'll, each, each task will get run on one of the threads in my current kernel. Now, that's really sort of the basic, basic set of operations that you have in L parallel. It doesn't really get much more complicated than that as far as directly interacting with kernels is concerned. Uh, there are some uh, other operations you can do. You can, for example, set the priority on a task by dynamically binding this task priority variable here. Um, and you can uh, you can also actually uh, make uh, queues in L parallel. So actually I've I've nicknamed the L parallel queue package to be queue. So again, my own sanity. Um, so I can say Q dot make queue. Uh, I can Q dot, uh, why can I never remember exactly the name? Right, because they use push and pop on Q. I, I find that naming really annoying, but such is the... Uh, Pretty much all libraries do that. But they're Qs. Yeah. N, Q, and D, Q. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> that was like, really? <laughs> push Q. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. Oh man, push Q, NQ, and DQ. Uh, I'm gonna put a CR for that. <laughs> so I have a question regarding these kernels. Um, yeah. According to the documentation. It says that the um, the kernel will not be garbage collected until end kernel is called. Now, is there yeah. like a width kernel at all, like or or something where you scope? Unfortunately, no. Um, okay. You're you're basically required to create a top level object for your kernel. Shoot. All right. I mean, you could define a width kernel macro. Right, I could certainly define it myself. It's just that I was curious if there was one already available. So I, I really don't like the decision to use a global, you know, dynamic variable for a kernel like that. Like, It'd be difficult to pull it off any other way. I think. I mean, you could always dynamically bind to it. True. You know. Um. The reason I ask is is the possibility of you know. Now, it's not, I don't think, useful for an application, don't get me wrong, like to have such a fine granularity over over different sets of thread pools, but you could see Actually, a situation. Actually, uh, it's, it's not uh, that weird for a given application to have multiple thread pools and be submitting and pulling off stuff from each thread pool. But usually um, that happens at the library level, right? So, like, if I have a database library, it will have its own, like, you know, connection pool which is a, a set of threads right. that it did during its initialization oh. or something else. But yeah. in, a, in an actual application where you have no, uh, no libraries other than L parallel, um, I guess the design decision of having a single global thread pool um, makes some sense, I guess. Uh, so, I don't know. It's a little awkward. Yes. It just doesn't feel right uh, for me. Uh, like it would be easier just to scope it inside, like say a function, um, and it'll be it'll be just nice because then when you invoke it, the I think part of the idea easy. is that making the kernel and cleaning up the kernel are both fairly expensive operations, uh, and so you probably would want to make them pretty widely scoped regardless. 
Okay. Right, um, because there's going to be some system call that goes in and uh, or uh, some interaction with the uh, outside the Lisp implementation uh, to schedule tasks, I guess, that you need to handle. No, carefully. I mean, it, it's entirely internal. It's just that making the threads isn't cheap. You know, and, and they have a little manager sitting atop them and creating all the resources for the kernel isn't cheap. The kernels aren't throwaway objects, I guess is my point. Uh, and there's not really any good reason to be making and destroying them all over the place. Um, so it, it just it ends up making a lot more sense to only create uh, a couple of kernels and reuse them all, all over the place, which means they tend to end up being pretty global objects regardless. Right. Uh, but going back, I, I mean, I could think of at least one situation where having such will be, something like that would be useful. Um, primarily, like, again, going back to the database example, right? Um, sure. The, it, it, if you shut down the connection pool, you know, during the destruction operation, you could totally see the kernel handling all the, okay, are you still connected? Close yourself off from, say, you know, the relational database that you're using or whatever. And, you know, it could do all that cleanup for you and the application programmer is oblivious to how is that doing with that. And don't, it, it's not a resource leak when it, because they forgot to call end kernel before they mm. exit their application, right? Because otherwise it is a resource leak technically and now you're, you're at the mercy of um, saying the, your database implementation to, to, to drop idle connections. Um, yeah. So that's that's one case that I could see it being like those kinds of IO situations where I see it would be very useful to have. That's that's basically what I, what I figured your response would be. <laughs> yep. Uh, so there are a couple of other things that you can do with it. Um, it does provide uh, some parallel operations. So I could uh, say. Uh, LP, um, EMAP, why is my LDOC not doing this job? There we go. would help if I uh, help if I actually made these slow. Wonder if IOTA will actually do that for me if I if I uh, I'll just make it. Yeah. Cool. Um yeah. So, uh, basically, pmap here is map, but it runs on your thread pool. It runs in parallel. Uh, it's just like regular map in every other respect, really, though. Um, so, you have that. You have LP, P, reduce. You have P, remove. P, remove, it's not. You have, like, a whole lot of these. Um, parallelized versions of sort of the standard uh, sequence operations in common list. Uh, you know, listen, you know, you can do a whole lot of stuff. There are two other oddities in there. You have um, 
is all documented in the, I believe it's the Cognate section. I have a question. The, yes. Is there a good reason that I'm not seeing as to why they don't have P map hash? <laughs> not that I can think of, apart from it being really awkward to implement efficiently. Fair enough. Okay. At least without implementation support. Because the internals of a hash aren't exposed well enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so you can use any of these uh, if you want to quickly parallelize a uh, some some kind of iteration or loop over a sequence. Uh, and we also have a few other operations. So as a as a promising system, so you can actually make a promise and then fulfill it. Uh, and then futures actually are, are promises that get uh, fulfilled using a parallel task. So it actually submits a task, and when that gets completed, then the promise that you get back is filled, fulfilled. So what is that force operation there that you have to do for the future? Uh, so that's basically, uh, that's how you get the result. And what that'll do is it'll block until the future has a value. Oh, okay. Okay, so that's basically wait, wait and return. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep. Same thing with promises. It just it it blocks until the promise is fulfilled, and then it returns the thing. Got it. And then you also have uh, what are called uh, speculations, which is a low priority task. But in other ways, it's like a future. And then you have delays, which are like uh, like features, but they only start getting executed when you try and force them the first time. They don't immediately be, get sent off to the task. Uh, and then you have uh, chain, which lets you... Um, I actually don't know Chain very well. I don't think it's that important personally. And there are actually better promise libraries out there. I wouldn't use L Parallel just for its promises, but it's nice the way that it integrates with the rest of the of the L Parallel framework. So, like using it specifically for futures may be convenient. And then you you know all the different cognates in the parallel sequences. And that's more or less all there is. Uh, there is a bit of error handling stuff where you can actually set it up so that. Around a certain context, I want errors, I want to find these errors when the error shows up on my worker thread. Uh, so that can be useful. Um, uh, I have a question. Um, yeah. In the Cognate library, um, that p fun call, like mm -hmm. right now, um, is that just partitioning the set and then uh, then calling fun call on each of those? Uh, Sub sub sublets like I'm just. Do you have any idea on how they like? I'm just curious. Like, how is that any different? Is that just a because it was a one to one mapping between um, uh, what's it? Uh, standard common list APIs and whatever. Um, I'm I just don't see what the value is um for calling a function that way in um in parallel um. Unless you're doing like a map or something like that, or reduce. It, it runs each of the arguments in parallel. Ah, okay, okay, that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, each of the arguments. Um, the other question I had is: is uh, do you have any idea on how the documentation mentioned that this actually is kind of how it hooks into L Farm? Um, have you ever played with uh, his, the L Farm um, API, which is uh, work, uh, distributing um, work across machines using L Parallel? I have not personally. Okay. All right. So L Farm is not something that I've worked with before. <laughs> okay. So that's an experiment that I should try myself. All right. It's okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> wishful, wishful thinking. <laughs> and then there's also this odd stuff they've got going on over here, which is um, C trees, which are where you have a bunch of operations that depend on the other operations, and it figures out what the right order to execute everything is in parallel. 
I haven't tinkered with that a whole lot, but it, it does look kind of neat. But yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's that's really all there is to El Parallel. It's it's pretty flexible. You can pretty easily make channels and um, you know shove stuff down them and get the results back. That's just really the basic operation of it. There is one. There is one thing that we didn't cover in that El Parallel documentation, which is. Uh... What was it? Is def def p def p u n or def p fun? Yeah, oh, def p fun. Yeah, def p fun. That's uh, rather def pun. Yeah, P-Lat. def pun. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it, it executes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so def p fun does something different than what I thought it would. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Def, Def Pun is one that I, I still haven't quite mastered yet because I haven't looked at it a whole lot. It's, uh, So reading the documentation here, it says that what Def Pond does is it handles the map reduce piece. It does a subdivide for us of the computation and the gluing automatically. Um, Something like that, yeah. So you could then handle, um, and it will look like a normal function to anybody who uses it. So. I gotta try this out. That's, that's a, that's something to check. Yeah, that one that one's a little weird because it, it looks like it's um Hmm. Just gonna try it out here with their Their Fibonacci example. See what it does. Something to look into. Yep, certainly. Anyway, um, so that's, that's all I really have on on Bordeaux threads and atomics and L parallel uh, today, I suppose. Uh, so uh, if we don't have any. You know, big questions. I don't really have anywhere further in particular. I, I want to take us. You know, within the next fifteen minutes. Yeah. Uh, any questions? Um, there is a there is a library that I don't really understand. Um, I'm not sure how much it overlaps with L Parallel um, or anything like that. Maybe we can cover in a future episode, and that's CL Flow. CL Flow. That's actually. I've heard of that, but I haven't looked at it much yet. Uh, CL dash flow. Uh, Nick Devil, do you have a, a question? No, I'm uh, I'm all right. Cool. Um, yeah, I've been done a lot of parallel uh, programming, so <laughs> it's more like I learned a lot from uh, from it. Cool. Probably go back and play with it a little bit. <laughs> Whoa. That's right, I've seen this. Yeah, I don't understand that at all, but I haven't really done any async. I, I've, I've read through it. I haven't had any use for it, uh, and I remember reading through this now. So, uh, dang it, this is using something um, interestingly like it looks an awful lot like uh, threading macros, but it's nothing like that. Well, it I was like, "What is what is this? This looks it's using the same um, notation, which kind of irritates me." But okay. <laughs> um, all right. Cool. 
Well, yeah. Well, so, um, yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot more to say, I suppose. But uh, I mean, there there are a lot of other ways we can we can explore further. We could talk about CL flow in the future. Um, we could talk about like uh, CL async in the future, and and things like you know actually like doing single threaded concurrency and event loops. Um, you know, and stuff like uh, like. Actually, covering uh, covering that would be useful because I know for I, I I've at least looked at um, there's a library that uses what was it lib lib uv behind that the would scenes? be CL async yeah oh CL async is the one that uses lib uv it, okay. it's actually uh, CL async is actually kind of broken at the moment though like oh. on the latest QL disk there are a couple things about it that seem to be breaking which I find kind of irritating and I might be looking into it a bit. Um, but yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, I think I think uh, we should I'd be, cover. Be happy to talk about it anyway. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about CL async next time, and even CL flow. I'm going to take a look at CL flow and see okay. what we could come up with. Um, but next week we're going to uh, continue our series on on concurrency in Lisp libraries, just because we're we're already down the rabbit hole, so we may as well keep going to its completion <laughs> to Wait a decent <laughs> to a decent stop. Um, so, if there aren't any more questions, people on the stream, if you have any more questions, I'll give you another minute or so, maybe a few seconds. Uh, um, as usual, um, uh, for folks who are just joining us, um, even though we're at the end of our episode, just a reminder, Atlanta Functional Programming has all these videos recorded and it's on our YouTube channel. Please just search for Atlanta Functional Programming and you will be able to look at this episode and other past episodes that we have covered. Um, see, no one else is talking about it? Yeah, I think we're good. Okay, I'll see you guys next week. Bye then. See you.